For those of you who have done your homework for our annual meeting this morning, you may find some of these words, most of these words, pretty familiar. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts upon the scripture and our experiences be acceptable to you, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was officially installed as your minister a year ago on May 5th, six months after my arrival. During the service, the Reverend Deborah Blood, the main, con main conference of the United Church of Christ conference minister, offered a charge to me as your minister. In her charge, she mentioned the song, You Can Do This Hard Thing by Carrie Newcomer. She is one of my favorite artist. Deb didn't know this at all. And that is one of my favorite songs. I consider her a modern day prophet, Carrie Newcomer, Deb too. And her music often speaks to me on a spiritual level. At the time of my installation, it felt like a tip of the hat to some of the things that we had already done, tackled together like bats and difficult budgets as well as a number of things in my history that got me to where I am. I can do hard things. It felt like a deep balm and blessing for our ministry ahead. Then a few days later, I hopped on a plane to California for my cousin's wedding in the Napa Valley. Life was really good. You see what's coming, right? I mentioned something about Carrie Newcomer being a prophet. Little did I know. The first town planning board meeting to discuss the homeless shelter at the home and mission house happened when I was on the plane on my way home to Cal from California. That event seemed to be a beginning of a litany of events that could provide fodder for the book of Job. Considering I started with a modern musical example, here is another. The past year seems a bit like extended verses of Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. Our possible partnership with the Homeless Shelter and the Holman Mission House lasted two more months, including two more planning meetings that took a great toll on many of you. In the second one, I passed a note to our moderator, Chris Magri, that said BREATHE in capital letters. It was already getting a little tense. As the meeting went on and the anxiety increased, I passed him another note that said BEER, again in capital letters. When I went home at the end of the third meeting, I will admit that it took some elixir from my grandmother's home state of Kentucky to get me to sleep. As the year progressed, that routine has been re repeated a fair bit. Thank you to everyone who put their energy and heart for mission into the homeless shelter project. Thank you for your witness and creativity and compassion. Throughout the rest of the year, we have continued to try to find options for the Holman Mission House. In fact, right now, we're offering Tuesday night supper clubs, which is brand new this week. May we continue to faithfully discern what might be next. In June, I attended General Synod of the United Church of Christ, the national gathering of the denomination that meets every two years. The privilege of Roy Scribner being with me for that as well. I've made it a point to go to General Synod because it is a prime opportunity to learn about resources and programming. It's a great way to network with colleagues so we can walk together in our ministries. As part of General Synod, attendees were asked to read the book Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. The author, Matthew Desmond, was one of the keynote speakers. At the end of June, to follow up on this learning opportunity, I offered a book discussion of Evicted to, to our congregation and the community. 
Although Milwaukee, where the book was set, and Farmington are different places, some of the same themes appear. In fact, they highlighted some of the reasons behind homelessness in our area. It was a grim discussion, certainly overlapped with our ongoing discussions with the homeless shelter. But I was thankful for your heartfelt compassion and desire to discuss the social justice issues around housing in our area. We started our program year off full of energy and possibilities. Our Christian education team is superb. We have a host of phenomenal teachers from UMF. There are amazing, then there are amazing precocious children and youth. Activities abound between youth group opportunities and the pancakery and the coat and cupboard and all the things that continue our mission and ministry, even with our youth and children. What a gift to Old South and the community. On September 16th, which just happens to be the day I was called to Old South, our community experienced a horrible tragedy with the explosion of the Leap building here in Farmington. The explosion killed Captain Michael Bell, sent a bunch of people to the hospital. Larry Lord, the maintenance manager who alerted everyone to the gas leak, spent seven months in the hospital and rehab. I happened to be on vacation in Spain, walking the Camino with my dad when the explosion happened. How horrible to be so far away as our congregation and community was, were dealing with a tragedy. Here's the amazing thing, though. Despite the fact that your minister was across the pond, we were able to put together a vigil that night. From the pictures and stories I heard, it was superb. I was able to arrange a couple of visitor visiting ministers to come and provide pastoral care if needed in the days that followed. What a joy to be in covenant with our local UCC churches. Dear ones, this is all a testimony to the lay leadership, the compassion, and the power that lies among you. That is the living out of the call to be church. As horrible as it felt to be separated from you in that moment, I felt so blessed to be part of Old South and once again looked forward to all we could do together. In late September, I learned of accusations of past sexual assault by an employee. That began a difficult journey, difficult conversations and discussions. Old South has a pretty decent safe church policy, but it didn't address something like this. So we resourced the main conference office and the national setting of the United Church of Christ, including the general counsel and the insurance board, other churches who have been through a similar process, as well as a number of other resources. We put together a response team to navigate the situation. The information went public to the congregation and the community at the end of January. To accompany the congregation through the process, we held a series of what came to be known as sacred circles to provide a time to process reactions and feelings. We held a book study on the Me Too Reckoning facing the church's complicity in sexual abuse and misconduct. Deborah Blood, the conference minister, led us in worship and facilitated a question and answer session on March 8th. On March 15th, we held an our turn after worship to discuss our proposed limited access covenant that would allow this community member to return to worship if they so chose at some point. And then at the April 2nd Executive Council meeting, we voted on a final draft, a draft of the limited access covenant. Our hope had been to present a new draft of the safe church policy for this annual meeting. With other high events that have hijacked our life as a church, 
that will need to wait until a later date. As heartbreaking and as challenging as this situation was, I was proud to be your minister in the midst of this. You are a deeply thoughtful, caring, responsible, amazing church. And what a privilege to be in conversation with you about that, however difficult it was. One of the highlights of the fall was a book study on the universal Christ. How a forgotten reality can change everything we see, hope for, and believe. We had a good group. Group met for seven weeks and used the curriculum that Rohr and his colleagues had prepared for the book. For the group, it was a wonderful time of reflective conversation, sharing, and as always, a bit of laughter. That is a part of the environment at Old South. Although we haven't done another book study in this fashion since, I am so thankful for your vulnerability in conversation and your willingness to learn together. Your care for each other in the congregation is palpable. In January and February, we held classes using the Call to Care curriculum through the United Church of Christ in order to strengthen our congregational care programs. We had just finished our classes when the winds of a Jobian storm started to reach us. With skills aplenty, we are coming, continuing to care for one another while building a structure that should help us manage how we offer that care in our present circumstance and beyond. One of the things that I deeply enjoy doing is sharing experiences that have guided my faith over the years. In September, I took my third trip to Spain to go on the Santiago de Compostela pilgrimage. In the fall, I shared one of my favorite Camino documentaries, Six Ways to Santiago. For our Lenten journey, I designed worship around a pilgrimage theme that allowed me to share a number of reflections on my pilgrimage. On March 11th, I was a guest speaker at the UMF Gold Leaf Program on Pilgrimage. Notice that date. And think about what was happening that week. Our pilgrimage may be a bit more eventful than we would have hoped, but I am glad that you are the group accompanying me on pilgrimage and that I am, am on that journey with you. Since we're talking about pilgrims as a teenager in the main conference, I was nurtured by the ministry of Pilgrim Lodge. It was and continues to be a force in my call to ministry. When I was negotiating my call agreement with Old South, one thing I asked for was a week at Pilgrim Lodge every summer to council that didn't count as vacation. I did just that in the summer of 2019 for Midler Spirit. I've also served on Pilgrim Lodge leadership team since January 20, 2019. And over the last few weeks, it has been heartbreaking, but ultimately a smart decision to cancel our summer camp season. We are indeed pilgrims on a journey. The Pilgrim Lodge journey, just as our own, continues, just continues, goes beyond, continues beyond the camp road. The litany of events over the last year is long. It has been challenging. In the fall and early winter, we already felt a little overwhelmed and amazed at how much we had been through. And then, just for kips, tick, kicks, we threw in a pandemic. <laughs> so, dear ones, it does indeed sound like a bit of a sequence from Job. COVID-19 precautions hit our part of the world in mid-March. We decided to suspend in-person worship initially until April 5th in hopes that we could be back in the sanctuary by Easter. Easter Sunday has come and gone and we are farther away from reopening for in-person worship than we will likely than we likely ever imagined we would have been. At this point, Job 
throws up his hands in the air and says, seriously, God, a pandemic? But in the midst of isolation and stay-at-home orders, we have found ways to continue to be church. You continue to care for one another. We have all increased our computer skills to gather for meetings. We worship together online. The CE team continues to offer some sort of Sunday school, as well as gatherings for younger children and middle school and high school youth. And gosh, let me tell you that children's moment that we taped earlier in the week could have stood by itself for a worship service. Amen? We have even held church happy hours. Our hearts break to see one another in person, but in the midst of it, we continue to be church. Thanks be to God. The scripture for our last worship service in person in the sanctuary on March 15th was Romans 5, 1 to 11. Here are those first five verses again, and my apologies for not using the gospel lesson this morning. It's in there somewhere. But here's Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his, this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope, remember those kids? Remember those kids? Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Now, I wouldn't say that we're boasting in our sufferings. I would say that we have enough integrity to admit our vulnerability. We have endurance. We have character. Oh, 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 do we have character? We have hope. Again, those kids. And the Holy Spirit is ever present with us. For God is good all the time. All the time God is good. Dear ones, I know these times can feel a bit like Job for another option. I find my for another option, I find myself humming the re refrain from a pop song. I get knocked down, but I get up again. As hard as it is, I am so grateful. Have I said that before? I am so grateful to be your minister. You continue to be a gem of a church in the world, even beyond the walls of our church building. We are a strong church community. May God's love and grace fortify us. May the call to follow Jesus strengthen our call to mission and ministry. And may the wind of the Holy Spirit blow through us, uplift us, and move us forward. Thanks be to God. Amen.